So, Paul, we've come an amazing way here. We're able to find out all these interesting things about planets, but I want to know more. I really want to know what are these planets, you know, how hot are they are? How hot are they? What are their atmospheres made out of? What's going on? Do they have winds? Do they have spots? Well, you know, I want to know more. And luckily, um, data with the exquisite precision of Kepler can actually get us some more facts rather than just the radius and the mass. Now, here's a plot we've seen before. This is showing the brightness versus time for ground-based data and the exquisite precision of the ground-based data versus time with the Kepler data. But now let's zoom in just at the top bit here. We can't really see it here because it's so small. But if we zoom in on that, um, we might expect to see something else going on. Um, let's imagine we've got a transiting planet like this. You look at brightness versus time. You get the big dip when it goes in front. But there's also going to be a little dip when it goes behind because you'll still see the star, but you'll lose the light from the planet. And because the planet is much smaller than the star, it's going to be a much smaller dip. So we'll see it going along here, the big dip when it goes in front, and then the small dip when it goes behind. And so the planet's actually reflecting the, the star's light? Yep. So it you does contribute a little bit. Zoom in on yes. the planet here, so you see um, the planet as it comes around the far side, we're seeing the reflected side, and then it disappears in front of the star and then comes out. Okay, so we expect the the planet to be quite dark here because essentially we don't see it maybe a crescent or nothing. Yep. And then on this side it's full, so we expect it to be as bright as possible yep. when it's behind. So there's two effects. One is the so-called um, secondary eclipse, which is when the planet goes behind the star. But also you notice that in between the curve isn't quite flat. Um, let's go back and play that again. Um, so it's going round. You'll see here we're looking at it face on. We're now looking at it half on. And now we're looking at a crescent. So that causes a, a, a dip here. So when it's on the far side, like it's coming out here, there's quite a bit of light from the planet. And then as the planet goes closer around towards us, that drops off because we're only seeing the dark side of the planet. And the planet's only shining because it's reflecting light. So in principle, we can see two things here. We can see this overall sort of sine wave type wobble due to being able to see the illuminated as opposed to the dark side of the planet. And we'll also see a secondary eclipse when it goes behind. And can we actually see that? Well, so here's the plot we were looking at before, uh, magnified seven times, and now it's magnified a hundred. Yeah, see so a little dip there, but if we magnify it, yeah, it becomes pretty. You know, yeah, pronounced. so you can see the secondary dip just about there, but with under the much higher magnification. We now begin to see the uncertainties in the Kepler data, <coughs> very much smaller than the ground-based one. On this scale, the primary transit is way off scale, yep. but you can see there's definitely a little bit of a dip here. But also, you can see there's a slope in between. So you really so, are seeing the light of the planet here directly, yeah. and you're seeing it disappear. So that is how bright the planet is, and that should tell us, at some level, you know, what its albedo is, how much light it's reflecting. That's quite exciting. Yep. Yeah. So there have been five of these things um, seen now by uh, Kepler, um, and this number will go up fast, I imagine. Uh, and most are reflecting curiously little light. Uh, most planets actually reflect quite a bit of the light that bounces off them, but these ones, it's less than 30%. So they're actually quite dark, which is a bit weird. So, okay, so we have five systems. Uh, they are very interesting, but the fact that they are curious, you know, not reflecting much light makes them, um, well, I guess the question is, is that what we expect? I mean, the Earth reflects about 30% of its light because it has clouds. Yep, and we think these things are gas giants, and gas giants also reflect light from clouds. Now, clouds are tiny droplets of something that's condensed in the atmosphere. In the case of Earth, they're water droplets typically, maybe ice if it's high enough up. In the case of Jupiter, these would be hydrocarbons of various descriptions. You can see the beautiful swirling colored patterns of the gas giants, it's Io in the front of Jupiter. Um, and so Jupiter reflects a lot of the light, and it's because of these cloud droplets. But people have done predictions, and because these Jupiters are so hot, these hot Jupiters, the ones Kepler are looking at, it could well be that there are very few things that actually form droplets. So mostly you've probably got a transparent atmosphere, and all the droplets are sunk down where we can't see them. So that might be why they're so dark. The light's just going right down into the gas till it can't come out, rather than being reflected off by clouds up high. Certainly things like water vapor and hydrocarbons, it would be far too hot for them to be up there. They'd just fall out in the form of rain. Okay, so maybe this isn't such a surprise after all. Yep. So many artists' impressions show things look like Jupiter. Odds are these things are actually much darker than Jupiter. I may not have these beautiful bands, might be rather more boring to look at. Okay. But that's not always the case. Um, look at the, this data, Brian. Um, this is okay. another transiting 
So, so this is another transiting object where we've zoomed right in, and so we don't show it, but there is this, uh, you know, the primary transit goes way off scale. But this one's a little different, and I note that it has a nice little transit. That's great. Secondary eclipse. Yep. Yeah, sorry, secondary eclipse. But uh, I note that when we fit that, it gets brighter here, and it's sort of that seems to sort of fit the data a little better than, for example, this green curve where it reaches its maximum brightness of the planet, reaches when it goes directly behind. So it seems kind of funny. It seems kind of asymmetric in this case, yeah. like there's something funny going on. You'd expect it as it goes behind, so let's say that's the light, and I'm going behind it. You'd expect it to be brightest here or here just either side because the light's shining full on my face. But what we're seeing is it's actually darker just before and brighter just afterwards. And it keeps on getting brighter, so it's actually brightest around here when some of it should be in shadow. Right, so it's almost like that there's this bright spot on the planet, since it's reflecting light. It's almost like there's a bunch of mirrors or clouds on one part of the planet, but not on the other part. So. Yep, indeed that's what people actually believe is happening in this place, that um, most of the planet is actually very dark, but one side is actually much brighter. Maybe it has clouds, but the clouds are all on one side. Maybe it's got some sort of circulation that the clouds form on the cold side of the planet or not the bright side or something that carry around one direction. But for whatever reason, this, if you like, is the first actual map of a planet around another star. Right. And the map seems to say that one half it's shiny, maybe from clouds, and one side isn't. Okay, so that's rather curious. There's been another case where you actually using the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so once you've found the planet using another technique, you then use the Hubble, which has the, also the benefit of being in space, but is a much bigger telescope than Kepler. And once again, they look at the secondary transits. In this case, they find that the dip in brightness varies by wavelength. And what you can tell is, in fact, the planet is very blue. It's actually a deep blue color. This is an artist's impression of what it might look like. Um, okay. And that also seems to suggest clouds. Um, the model they come up with here is actually clouds, but you need some chemical that can survive this very, very hot environment. When your water vapor won't do it. So it's not something like our own atmosphere, which is kind of a deep blue as well. I mean, the Earth's blue because, well, actually, because that is an ocean. But if it an didn't have an in the atmosphere, yeah, yes. but it does scatter a lot of uh, light. Mm. Um, maybe preferentially blue, but this one, I guess, we think is truly a different type of color than something like the Earth or... Yeah. And the best guess is that the, the sort of thing that might condense and form clouds would actually be glass, silicon dioxide or quartz, because at the temperature we think this planet is at, that's something that actually could form droplets or crystals. So in this case, it may well be that we've got clouds of glass, and therefore your winds of glass, is probably very strong winds on these things, and so maybe even rain of glass. So you'd literally be sandblasted there uh, if you were there. You'd be, yeah, uh, I mean, you'd be fried long before you got sandblasted, but nonetheless, not a very pleasant planet. That might look quite pretty. Wow, well, okay, that's a, like an interesting place to visit, uh, at least uh, from, the, from space. So we're beginning to get a first few clues as to what the planets are actually like, and they're coming out quite interesting.